One of the most iconic, memorable, powerful scenes in Arcane. How do you write a scene like this? How do you write an iconic scene? So there's a lot of reasons a scene could become that one scene everyone is talking about. But what I think it comes down to in most cases is creating emotional power. How do you create emotional power in a scene? So I want to set this up in levels. Let's talk about five levels of creating emotional power. For example, if I want to make my audience sad. Level one, show character being sad. Character cries. Audience experiences the emotion vicariously through the character, and we're done, that's the scene. Level 2, character starts out not sad, then character becomes sad. That's going to be felt a bit more strongly. Level 3, character starts out happy, then character becomes sad. So let's pause for a second here. What's going on? What progression am I describing? So I think it works like this. If we're evenly, steadily in an emotion, we feel it, but we can sometimes sort of forget that it's what we're feeling after a little bit. It becomes normal. Our mind kind of moves on to other things. But when our emotions change, that's when we experience our emotional state much more strongly. We notice the difference between what we felt a second ago and what we're feeling now. It makes us focus on our emotions. We fixate on them. And in storytelling, that ups the power of a scene. And this, I think, is a foundational principle in storytelling. We feel emotions more strongly when they change. And that emotional change is what we're going to be on the lookout for when we craft our scenes and our beats. So that's levels 1 to 3. If I start out sad and stay sad, that's one level. If I start out neutral, start at 0, and then become sad, that's going to be felt a lot more strongly. And if I start at the other extreme, happy, and then go all the way to the other extreme, start at 100 and then go to negative 100, that's going to be felt the strongest. For an example, and this fits perfectly with our topic of iconic scenes, first scene in the movie Up, classic iconic sad scene, and we start out very happy and we get to very, very sad. Think about how that scene goes if it starts out that sad. How much of the sequence of scenes is how sad it becomes? Think how much of that sadness comes from how happy it all started out. Okay, so we're at level 3, extreme to extreme, start out happy, go all the way to sad. And in level 3, let's say the scene is 4 minutes long, and this emotional journey happens over the course of the scene. So level 4, instead of taking 4 minutes, we're happy for 2 full minutes. Then we do the entire emotional journey in 10 seconds, happy to sad, all of a sudden, just like that. If we feel emotions more strongly, when it's emotional change, one extreme to another, then if we concentrate that journey, that emotional power we created, into a smaller package, a shorter amount of time, then we'll feel it even more strongly. So that's level four. Level five is concretization. This one is going to seem kind of weird at first, but it's everywhere, and you'll see what I'm talking about once we get to examples. Concretization of emotions, it's like the thing that ruins everything is physically small. The idea here is that just like we can concentrate that extreme moment of emotional change into a shorter time and it becomes more powerful, concentrating emotion in space also makes it more powerful. Character is about to be happy, and then one tiny little thing goes wrong and it ruins everything, that's powerful. And this can be a tiny factor, but it hits differently if it's physically tiny or at least physically limited if it's not actually super small and if this sounds weird if you're skeptical like i said this is everywhere this is why achilles heel is a thing it's not like achilles torso or achilles thigh it's achilles heel his weakness is the small little thing this is why kryptonite is a thing one little rock takes down superman this is every single MacGuffin. they're all small think about heist movies where they're trying to steal one single jewel think about movies where you have like the one little computer chip or the one little usb drive you know forget the one ring let's talk about irl examples this is why wedding rings are thing. We concentrate all of our feelings, our love, our bond into this tiny material object. This is why crowns are a thing. This is why flags are a thing. All my patriotic feelings, all my love of everything about my country concentrated into this one physical thing I can salute. Or alternatively, everything I hate about a country concentrated into one thing I can burn. So this is levels one through five, and obviously there's a lot of ways to make scenes emotionally powerful. These five levels are just about a single method, but it is a method, it's a tool, use it where it works, and level five in particular really doesn't work for everything. Just to give an example of a level 5 scene, well, two examples. Actually, let's do three examples. So the ring being destroyed, obviously a great example of this. We don't just get victory, we get extreme all hope is lost all the way to extreme victory. It comes down to a single moment, and it's a small little thing. Much more interesting example to me is the pill scene in The Matrix. This is the scene where we go from Matrix to reality, armchairs to gritty threadbare sci-fi world. And that's not a gradual process. We go through a lot very abruptly. We're sitting in armchairs one moment, and the next we're being unplugged in human food group, and then we're being grabbed by a big machine arm, and then boom, we're in a gritty new reality. And what did it all come down to? The path to reality is concretized in this tiny, tiny form. It's taking a single pill. Example three, and this is the scene that taught me this idea like 12 years ago when I first saw it, one of my favorite 
favorite scenes of all time. And one of the first scenes that I saw that made me think, okay, I got to sit down and think about what's going on here. The walk to Arlong Park from One Piece. We go from extreme hopelessness level negative 100 to hope restored level 1000 and it happens in seconds. And it's concretized for us with the hat, with this moment of Luffy giving Nami his hat. Okay, now I lied and there's actually nine levels. I broke them up because they're a bit more involved. So let's get back to Arcane. So we're going to see all five levels in the Guns for Hire scene, but we're going to see a lot more too. So let's examine what the scene is so far according to the framework we're building. Jinx, where are we at with her? So we're basically here. After the Vi hallucination messes her up, Jinx displays some real antagonism towards Vi. She's resentful of her need for Vi, and she shows that in multiple scenes. And the scene we see right before, she doesn't believe Vi is back at all, and appears to not even care. We suspect she does, we hope she does, but from what we're seeing on screen, there's a lot of emotional barriers in the way. Vi, where are we at? She's coming to terms with the notion that Powder suffered a fate possibly worse than death. Powder didn't die, she's been taken in and corrupted by Silco. Which means it's not just a matter of finding a single person, Vi is realizing she's going to have to bring down the whole Silco regime. So it's going to be a lot harder than she thought. So with both sisters, we're really emotionally far from any hope of this reunion whatsoever. And then, in a moment, the torch comes out, our concretization level 5, and everything changes. We go from slow-paced Vi scene and slow-paced flashes of Jinx, from this hollow realization of Vi and Jinx showing no emotion, from very still characters, very quiet, to every feeling all at once, and the characters are running and sliding and spinning and stopping and hallucinating, and the music, oh my god! So you're noticing these other things, they're doing a lot more here. What's all What's all this? What's Kate helping Vi? All these flashes of these different scenes, and then the music, why is the music here? And then this, we're seeing Marcus for some reason, why is that? there. So I sped through a few of these when I was describing the scene. Let's go over it all more in depth. So first of all, when we're talking about powerful scenes, it's not just about the scene itself, it's the context, it's the surrounding scenes, it's the build-up. And the idea of build-up, which is level 6, is pretty obvious. Makes sense that anticipation, suspense, withholding what we want to see, all that is going to make scenes a lot stronger. But I want to flesh out a particular here and talk about a reason for build-up which might not be so obvious. So one of the particulars we're seeing here in Arcane is a very easy shortcut that can go really wrong. And that shortcut is making characters wait a really long time, a really really long time for something they want. And we don't need to see all that time pass, it can be a time skip. And the thing that can go wrong, and this might be with Stephen Moffat, this waiting thing is a shortcut, and it can easily turn to telling not showing. And Stephen Moffat and Doctor Who overused the heck out of waiting. Oh my gosh, it was everywhere. There were times when it felt like every single big moment was someone waiting a long, long time, and that was it. So don't overuse it. Arcane didn't overuse it. Arcane used it once, and they used it in the right way. They had a time skip, making us wait three episodes for the sisters to be reunited. That's a fine build-up, making us wait seven years in story, way more powerful. So that added to all those other scenes we talked about earlier of the sisters trying to figure out what the situation is, anticipating it, grappling with it, that whole thing. So that's level six, emotional buildup, and this seems very straightforward. You build up emotional scenes by building up emotions. But there's something else going on here. We need level seven as a framework, and then we'll understand six more deeply. Level seven I'm calling embellishing the change. So what was all this stuff? Vi and Kate running, Soko getting mad, Vi flipping this guy off. What was that about? So this is something else I mentioned briefly. We don't just get one change here. Hopelessness about the potential reunion to hopeful. We make that change feel stronger by adding a bunch of sudden changes along with it. We get very physically still scenes with both characters, and then we're running and escaping and spinning, oh my god, the camera work changing, the whole setting implodes. We get this empty horror from Vi, this measured threatening evenness from Soko, this quiet moment of consideration for Jinx, and then we're anxious and we're scared and we're getting mad and we're hallucinating. It's a lot of secondary emotional shifts. Soko goes from calm to enraged, Kate is afraid, we get desperation, Vi is angry all of a sudden for a very meaningless reason, but that anger also allows us this moment where it all drains away just as quickly as it came. It's all focused on these smaller emotional changes which support the big emotional change that we're feeling here. And that's where the build-up comes in, level 6. This build-up we did with all these scenes is not just building the emotion up, it's adding a new emotion. It's the sudden catharsis we get from seeing this thing we've wanted to see for a long time. We add that to the pile of emotion. So now we have hopelessness to hope, longing to catharsis, calm to rage, empowerment to fear. We get sadness, we get humor even. This whole thing Vi is doing is kind of funny. They fill us to the brim with different emotions. We go from feeling feeling like one-ish emotions in this scene before to feeling all of that. And that's on top of all these other aesthetic functional shifts of pacing and physicality, all secondary changes to accompany the main change of hopelessness to hope. So that's embellishing changes, level 7. Level 8 has mostly to do with the music. The music fits level 7 as well. We go from quiet to sudden music. But let's look a bit deeper than that. Why music? And also, what's with shots like this? The broken wall with the heights of vine powder, and the thing with the eye symbol as a whole, and the hallucinations. We said sadness, but it seems like there's more here. And also, What's this scene? What's with a specific bullet parallel? So level 8 is what I call atmospheric overload. On top of the emotional overload we just talked about, what do they do? They throw a ton of sensory symbolism at you. And the key here is that these are all things you're really not supposed to think so deeply into in the moment. It's just going too fast. We don't even know what this symbol is supposed to be. But 
when we see it fall in silicone, we're like, oh. And then we see the ruins of Vine Powder's childhood home, and we go, oh man. And then Vine and Kate are like bullets in a gun. Does that make sense? I don't know, but oh wow. And then Milo and Clive are suddenly appearing again. Oh my gosh. And there could be cool ideas and interpretations here. I'm not saying there aren't, but it's so fast. We're supposed to be absorbing it more than paying attention to it. We're not analyzing anything we're seeing. We couldn't possibly. We just don't have the time. It's just this feeling of overload. We're just taking so much in at once. And that's the music as well. Music pours gas on the fire of what we're feeling. It's the perfect tool to increase the amount of emotion without accidentally making that emotion more complex and more distracting than we need it to be. And it works similarly to this fast symbolism. We catch words here, there, goodbye, and the world is on fire, and friends, and guns, and walls tumbling down. But it's all happening too fast for us to think about any of it. It's just words that fit and enhance the emotions we're feeling. To give you a good example of this atmospheric overload, there will hear him charge at the end of two towers. We're already seven levels in. We get the losing to winning emotional change. It happens in seconds, it's built up, we get concretization with the one rider alone on the hill, we get lots of emotions, fear, pride, self-preservation, self-annihilation, but then atmospheric overload, we get the sensory symbolism, white to black, high and low, human and inhuman, and of course the glorious dawn illuminating the darkness, and then the music pouring gas on the fire of all of this. Okay, so level 9, the final level, Marcus, why are we showing the bridge here? And this applies somewhat to Soko, but more so to Marcus, the scene is about the sisters, so shouldn't that be the focus? So level 9 is about thematic time, specifically as expressed with a montage of thematically similar scenes across multiple arcs, showing a thematic grouping of all the big changes happening in the story at the same time as this main big change increases the momentousness of the emotion exponentially. It doesn't increase the emotions directly, it increases how important we feel those emotions are. The sisters reuniting, fine, big, wow, but the sisters reuniting while Soko has a mental breakdown, while Piltover and Zon are sailing off from one another, everything big happening all at once, and it's all the same theme, separation, distance, longing to rectify failures, that makes us realize, wow, this scene is really about everything. And obviously be careful with montages that can be really cheesy and cheap, they're overused for sure. You really, really need to have your other levels of emotional power in check in order for this to work. But when montages are done well, oh man, they are some of the sweetest, coolest, most satisfying scenes ever. So now that we have all nine levels, and just to help understand level nine better, let's go through some examples of complete level nine scenes. So these are mostly climaxes, and the first one is in Arcane, it's the final scene. Arcane's climax is arguably even a stronger level nine scene than Guns for Hire. I would not object to that statement at all. Guns for Hire still takes the cake for me on the personal level, but that final scene, oh man, we just get so much. The moment of Jinx firing and this full story long build up, the complex mix of all kinds of emotions, and the symbolism of the rocket shooting across the blood red moon, and the music, oh man, the music. And then we get the montage, the different climaxes happening all at once, and the montage of all the characters everywhere. And then we get another sudden shift with the end of it all. We get action, 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 height of everything, height of emotion, height of music, everything, and then it all suddenly stops and we get silence and blackness. It's so powerful. This scene is just level 9 out of its mind. Neck and neck with guns for hire, total bias record for me. Other examples of level 9 scenes with all 9 levels done really well. I don't want to go into detail too much with these because of spoilers. There's a One Piece episode that is a gigantic spoiler so I won't say the scene. Just the final scene of episode 485 is also level 9 out of its brain. One of my favorite scenes of anything ever in my favorite arc of anything ever. Return of the King, same scene we talked about earlier, is a really great level 9. Cloud Atlas has multiple scenes that qualify but really the whole movie is just one big level 9 scene. And level 9 specifically, that's the main tool of the entire story and great movie by the way. If we're a bit looser and talk about secrets of scenes. Two Towers has one a bit later than the scene we talked about. Return of the Jedi has a very simple one. Princess Mononoke has a really interesting one. These scenes are just so fun to find and dissect. And for all the rules I said, and for all the Guns for Hire is a uniquely excellent example of this method of creating emotional power, these scenes are not that uncommon. They pop up a lot. And I'd love to hear your favorites in the comments, even if it's not all nine levels, but just really great emotionally powerful scenes that use a lot of these. Five specifically, the concretization. I love seeing good examples of that, so let me know if you think of any good ones. And something else I just want to make sure to point out about this whole system is that there's a fractal thing going on with all these levels. You can take some of them and do them multiple times in multiple ways within a scene. One of my favorite examples of this is the shallow scene in The Star is Born, which I will not play the audio of because I'm sure I get slaughtered by copyright. But this whole scene is concentrated time-wise. It's a great example of level 4 on the whole, but then they repeatedly do level 4 moves within the scene as well. The best one is this. She's up there singing, which is already intense, but then they up the intensity like 500% when she starts belting. And it's so abrupt, they had her not even take a breath between singing the low part and then suddenly belting. It was that sudden and then we got the audience applause, also sudden. And then of course we get another 500% increase when she goes up to the main mic. And we thought she was giving it her all before, but she's Lady Gaga, and now we see her do it for real here. And before that, the whole scene, even Bradley Cooper inviting her up, is extremely abrupt. So this whole scene is the sudden change. It's when the star is born, not gradual. It's this scene when she is born. And then within the scene, the change in intensity is also super concentrated into single moments throughout the scene. Even if you haven't seen this movie, go watch this scene in particular if you want a great example of how this works. It doesn't need any context. 
So back to Guns for Hire, they do this too with a few different levels, having multiple instances within the same scene. And let's expand out to the broader scene this whole sequence is a part of. So level 4, Concentration, we have the initial montage part, that's one level 4 moment. The meeting itself is also concentrated and sudden. Jinx, that identity, almost disappears when we're seeing Powder again. And then the reversal of that is also concentrated and sudden. Kate appears and then it's just a quick 180. Jinx is abruptly back in all of her jinxiness. And the ensuing hallucinations and even the arrival of Echo, that's more sudden changes. And Echo is mostly there to transition us to the next part of the scene, where Vi sees with her own eyes what her sister has become. But the firelights are also there for level 7, embellishing the change. We go from the scene that's a release and easing of all of our pent-up tensions, everything makes sense now, to all of a sudden everything seizing up and nothing makes sense anymore. We go from a quiet reunion to all-out fighting. And this is all part of all these ancillary emotional changes that we're experiencing within the scene. Confusion, worry, betrayal, realization, fear, chaos. And then another concentration, suddenly it's all over, and by the way, a brilliant subtle level 8 symbolism. We started with blue smoke and we end with black smoke. That contributes to the overload of this whole sequence. Level 5, concretization. I want to mention this too. We have the torch, but we also have another level 5 in this scene. And this is a level 5 that's going on throughout all of Arcane. It's this, the gemstone, this tiny little gemstone. We get this symbolic gemstone moment when Jinx thinks the torch didn't do anything. And then we get this other gemstone moment when they actually reunite and hug. And we get this moment within the mounting feelings of confusion and betrayal. So you can apply each one of these levels, but you can apply them multiple times within your scenes, and it all just ups the emotional power. Obviously, you don't make it too cluttered, too confusing. Okay, that's it for talking about the levels. I want to talk about one more major thing about this scene, not connected to emotional power, something I've sort of talked about before, cliffhangers. So I made a video a while ago about how the end of season one is not a cliffhanger. This ending here to act two is a cliffhanger, and it's a brilliant one. And we're going to discuss why, but in order to do that, I need to blow your mind in a bad way. I need to show you the worst cliffhanger in history, which interestingly may or may not share some elements with a Guns for Hire scene. And talk about iconic, I'm sure some of you have seen this before, it's that infamous. If not, don't worry, you need zero context, that's how bad it is. And if you're wondering why he climbs over the edge, no reason. Actually, no reason. And I think the actual reason for this has to do with editing, they cut some scenes out or something. But that's the scene, he just randomly climbs over the edge, he hangs perilously by his umbrella, and the episode ends. So obviously this is so awful because you have a character doing something so outrageous for absolutely no reason. But I want you to notice something here. All cliffhangers have that final moment that puts the audience in suspense. But some cliffhangers, often the worst ones, in order to get to that moment, commit a truly egregious writing sin. They halt story progress or even actively regress the story. And that's the problem with the scene forget cliffhangers, every scene should be advancing your story. If we're now going to have to take the long way around because of some new stupid obstacle we're introduced to with this cliffhanger scene, or worse, if we're forced to back up and now we'll have to cover the same ground as we did before again, and so now we're dreading that too on top of just the general pain of dissatisfaction from the cliffhanger itself, that is the absolute worst. Worst kind of cliffhanger, worst kind of scene. And that's actually what could have happened here with Jinx and Vi's botched reunion. The cliffhanger itself is Vi getting kidnapped by the firelights, but to get there, we sort of undid this whole big moment the entire last three episodes we're setting up. And that is where the scene leaves us. Sorry, Arcane fans. Back up. No reunion this week. No resolution to the sisters' arc. Tune in next week. Right? Isn't that what's happening here? Aren't we regressing the story? So no, absolutely not. And that is the important takeaway with the scene. Good cliffhangers still advance the story just as much as any other good scene does. A bad cliffhanger makes us think we're about to advance the story, but instead the scene ends and we're stuck where we started off. It's like a fake scene. We don't get any scene, much less the story progressing in the way we wanted or expected. Good cliffhangers don't leave us where we started off. They advance the story a lot, we cover a lot of new ground, it's just not the progression we expected, it's something else. In this scene, the reunion, a lot did happen, a lot of important stuff. Vi sees what her sister has become, Jinx also sees what her sister has become. This changes the entire trajectories of these characters. Vi mostly stops trying to reunite with Jinx because she realizes that she has to go after Soko. Jinx also kind of switches gears here to focusing on people she thinks betrayed her, Soko and Caitlyn, but also eventually setting up the tea party. And Caitlyn too, she realizes the real story behind this girl she's becoming close to. And then that creates a wedge between them that they'll be contending with for the entire rest of the show. That starts here. So by the time we get to that cliffhanger moment of suspense at the very, very end, we've gotten a full scene, we've eaten a full nine course meal, and then that scene comes and it's like, oh, we gotta hold off on dessert for a bit. And yeah, we sort of want dessert, but we're full. Bad cliffhangers, it's like they snatch away the plate before we can even start eating. I think I heard this idea from Brandon Sanderson. He said a bad cliffhanger is when the door opens, we don't see who it is, but our character sees and is shocked, and then roll credits. A good cliffhanger is the door opens, our character sees who it is and is shocked, we also see who it is, we're also shocked, and then 
roll credits. I think that's this idea. Seeing who it is advances the story. It's not halting progress, it's setting a new course. And that's the real key here. Good cliffhangers are new beginnings masquerading as endings. And that's exactly what episode 6 is doing here. We wanted this reunion that we didn't get, but we very much do get something in its place. We get new beginnings of all these arcs of Jinx by Kaden that actually we'll explore. So I think that is the way to write cliffhangers. Invest in the scene, pile important developments on top of one another, set a new course, set multiple courses. Just because we're stopping before the resolution doesn't mean we can't pack the scene with enough amazing stuff that our audience will leave satisfied anyway. Okay, last thing I wanted to talk about, and small point, but it's my favorite line in the whole scene. Are you real? I love this little moment. The subtext here is making use of what's called dramatic irony, where the audience knows something the characters don't. Vi hears her sister expressing something very normal. Are you real? Is this really happening? I've been waiting so long for this moment I never thought would come. I'd almost given up entirely. That's one version of are you real? But we, the audience, knows that is not what Jinx means at all. She means are you real or are you a hallucination? Jinx is so far gone that she's actually circled back entirely and has started to sound normal in some moments. For Vi, this is a resolution, a moment of getting her sister back. For us, this is a signal of the polar opposite. We hear this and we're like, uh-oh, Vi is not getting powder back. She is hugging a different person than the girl she remembers. The sentiment that Jinx is actually expressing is something that Powder would never say. And this line foreshadows that new course the scene will set of Vi learning who Jinx is and struggling with that knowledge. Such a great little moment. And also, side note, listen to this. Do you hear that? I love this line for a completely different reason. If I'm right here, you tell me. Listen again. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? Is this Ella Purnell's British accent coming through? I'm not seeing this as a mistake. I love this. I love that she's so in this moment as this character that her real self slipped through. And she's mentioned before in an interview just how much she gets into these voice acting sessions. So you got to tap into the crazy. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. In my audition, it was like climbing the walls and like ripping my clothes. Oh, yeah. We're like full on crazy. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought that was a little cool moment too. Really everything about the scene, just so great. And I'm gonna do something that I usually don't. I wanna recommend something on this topic with a request attached, an offer actually. And it's something that I wrote. It's something I'm pretty proud of, even though it's old. I wrote this like over 10 years ago. I've been published a few times for short stories. I think this is the only one you can find online, I'm not sure. It's a short story about a poor child who encounters a mermaid. I wrote it when I was first coming to understand all the stuff about concentrating and concretizing emotional power. So you see it very clearly following the patterns we talked about in the first half of this video. And my request, my offer, is that I've always wanted to see this flash fiction story illustrated. So any artist listening to this, if you feel so inspired after reading it, please tweet any perspective illustrations to me. And once I get a few, if I find some I really like, I'm willing to pay a good rate to get this produced. So I'll leave the link to that story in the description, give it a read if you want. The two issues on my webcomic Minor Champion also follow a lot of these principles if you want to check that out as well. Hope you enjoyed the scene breakdown of my favorite moment in all of Arcane. Comment what your favorite scene was and what you loved about it, I would love to hear. Support me on Patreon if you wish, love connecting with people there, chatting with them. Thanks to all the patrons, but I want to give a shout out this week specifically to Ariel D. Salvatore. Hello One Piece fan, you didn't even need to tell me, I could tell by the D. Bunch of shorts in the coming weeks, and then after that another long video, so subscribe to catch all that, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks for watching.